Hi, it's Heather from Craftlet. It wouldn't be the first week of November 2024 if everything didn't go wrong. Today, our live stream streamed to my personal YouTube channel instead of the Craftlet one. And as a consequence, I've had to move it here. So I've added this intro and I've added thank yous at the end. And, uh, and I just wanted to let you know, book it with Becca. You can follow her on Goodreads. You can follow her blog. Links are in the notes below. Lisa Raby, who came and joined us as our special guest. You can get all of her information at linktr.ee slash excessively diverting. She is many places as at excessively diverting. And I hope you go and listen and read more of what she shares. She's definitely a craft lit person and knitter. So, you know? And I believe she said right now she is reading Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice on her TikTok channel. So definitely go to her link tree and take a look and go and uh, have fun. Unlike most craftlet things, this one is not family friendly. There are, um, as listener Ann told me, as the sign that listener Ann made for me several years back, which says, I can swear like a well-educated sailor, that happens today. Again, well-educated, but also sailors. So, forewarned is forearmed, not for delicate ears. All right, I think that's it. Let's dive into the live stream that went the wrong place, but is back now. Here you go. All righty. <sighs> if you are here for the Craftlet live stream or you are showing up shortly for the Craftlet live stream, hi there. I'm Heather, host of Craftlet, and I have here with me two awesome Austinian book lovers. So uh, we had Becca with us last time. So this time I'm going to start by introducing Lisa, who comes from all sorts of Austin-y, Bronte-y Bronte places. So I wanted to make sure you yeah. got a chance to tell everybody who you are. Okay. I want to preface and say I never thought I was an Austin super fan until I listed everything that I do for Austin in the email to you, Heather. <laughs> it's like, oh <laughs> I think because I don't go to the AGM or buy Regency clothes or travel to England to go to Bath or Chowton, I'm not a super fan, but uh, clearly, I'm wearing my Austin Headstrong Girl t-shirt. So anyways, my name is Lisa. I'm a librarian, a bookseller, and a writer. I live in Northern Michigan with my husband, who I sometimes like, and our pug, Thursday. I run a tiny little Jane Austen and Bronte empire called Excessively Diverting. And it actually started out as an Etsy store about 12 years ago. I was making Austin and Bronte and other classic lit crafts and selling it on Etsy. And I was in grad school at the time and school got really overwhelming and I was looking for a full-time job and all that good stuff too. So I closed the store down. And then about five or six years later, I kept the domains, excessivelydiverting.net. And I wanted to do something special. So in 2017, I started the blog. And I'm... My, I, I don't want to say my expertise, but my super major interest is in Austin and popular culture and how she's viewed in the 21st century. So I started collecting like various different things and writing about it. So I have Austin lip balm. I have Austin candles. I have Austin pops. I have a lot of Austin shit. And the blog did okay, but I got a lot more comments, followers, engagement on social media. So I took down the blog and just pointed the URL to Excessively Diverting's Facebook page. And I post, so now we're on Facebook, Mastodon, Blue Sky, Instagram. Over on my TikTok, my personal TikTok, I'm actually reading Pride and Prejudice with commentary and swears, which I started in August. I love so that. Every episode is, I'm reading a chapter, I'm adding commentary as I read, and I have a potty mouth. So it's 
I get very angry at some aspects of how people perceive some of Austin's work. So I need to comment on that quite a bit. And that's actually on hiatus right now because uh, a lot of life stuff happened. So I'm going to pick it up back in end of the month. I do have to give a shout out to, I have Flat Jane. <gasps> and Flat wow. Jane is a project started by the Jasna chapter of Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho. And so the idea is that you take Flat Jane with you wherever you go and you take pictures of her and you post it on social media. So Jane's been with me to the vet, to the library. Uh, she went apple picking with me, post office. Like she just goes, I just take her with me everywhere I go. So I thought I would mention her in, in, in today. Yeah. So that's that Jane. And that's pretty much it for me. I, <laughs> that's not nothing. There were so many points where I just wanted to be like, wait, stop. Say more. I know. Yes. <laughs> exactly. All right. I am updating the link in Instagram because this is, oh no, stupid. Now on, what happened is we are broadcasting not on the Craftlet channel, but on my personal channel because uh, Zoom failed us. So I'm just updating people on that because I don't come with an assistant. But Becca, you need to tell everybody about yourself. Yeah, I don't really know how to follow Lisa, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I was just listening to this. Oh man, I'm so uncool. I basically am just a giant Jane Austen fan, book enthusiast generally. I, I've been reading Austen since I was a kid, like most people, and I've just been getting more and more obsessed with time. I was very lucky when I was um, in school to take a class. I actually took a couple of classes with Dr. Janine Barkas, who is, of course, an Austen scholar. And I already loved Austen, but during those classes, I really loved Austen, and I figured out how to unravel all the things that she's doing and how to articulate just how incredible she is. You know, a lot of what we did was just looking at, okay, what are the words that she uses over and over again? What are the weird little objects that she drops that you can learn so much from if you go be like, what was that thing? And what was the cultural relevance of it? There are so many layers to what she's doing with her writing that I just think other people pale by comparison. So I really love the depth of her writing. Things that I do, I don't work with book things, unfortunately. I worked at an art museum for a while and I led the book club there for members, which was very fun. But now I'm somewhere else not doing bookish things, which is why I love the Craft Lit community so much because y'all are always willing to talk weird books with me. But I do have an Instagram and a blog, both Book It With Becca. And I've been pretty indifferent about posting for the past year just because life has been busy. Good, but busy. But that's a good place to find me. You'll see frequent updates on what I'm reading or just like what my favorite new watches were, movies of the past month, because I also really love film. So that's me. I'm super excited for this talk because I always want to talk, Emma. <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. I did read your blog post, Becca. Thank so you. I'm proud. But when Heather emailed me to start setting this up, I told her, I said, okay, I'm going to need to speed read Emma this week because I haven't read it in a really long time. And that did not happen. But well, now I do have some updated retellings of Emma. I have mm -hmm. the manga. I have the graphic novel. <gasps> and I forgot... It was called The Jane Austen Project. I forgot who the publisher was, but contemporary authors were asked to do an update on a particular Austen story. For example, Curtis Sittenfeld did an update of Pride and Prejudice where Lizzie and Darcy are having hate sex. It's fantastic. But Alexander <laughs> McCall Smith 
did an update of Emma and she's an advertising exec. Same, same premise. She's meddling in other people's lives, except that's brought up to the 21st century. For those of you who are watching or listening, you can speed read your way through Emma pretty quickly by reading the manga. You won't get the nuances or the deliciousness of, her, of Austin's language, but you'll at least get the gist of the story. It was good. And there are also some very good movie adaptations too, which probably mm-hmm. takes even less time. Yeah, that is that's true. true. I'm. I have heard about the manga version. I have not read it yet. Readered it. Yes. How do you like it? I did review it. I'm also a reviewer for No Flying No Tights, which is a graphic novel slash manga review site that's run by a library, a librarian for librarians. So. All the reviewers, our librarians are somehow connected to the library world. I think there's even a few booksellers. It's fine. Um, I had some quibbles about some of the language that was used. I felt like Austin, Austin's genius was lost. I felt it catered more toward telling the story rather than being influenced by Austin telling the story. Another quibble, and this is a big one in the Jainite community, is the clothing representation. We're not Regency correct. I had to do my own. The clothing situation was one of those things like I knew that it wasn't correct, but I had to do my research just to be on the safe side to make the commentary and the review. The graphic novel is a lot better. And the Alexander McCall Smith retelling of Emma is hilarious. So I greatly recommend if you're a manga reader. Read the manga. I don't... Yeah. You'll get the essence, but it, it doesn't showcase Austin's brilliance. Yeah. No one can showcase Austin's brilliance like Austin can. That's true. I've read a That's lot true. of retellings of her work, and some of them I really liked, and some of them I didn't. But always at the end of it, I'm just like, wow! Like the there's a lot of confidence that goes into thinking that you can retell an Austin story. <laughs> It's just oh, like- absolutely. Absolutely. And that was one of the things that kind of spun me towards becoming more in touch with the community, the pop culture community, as far as Austin is concerned, because there's oodles and oodles of paraliterature book of retellings of her stories in a variety of different genres and settings. And it's... I actually started keeping a list on Amazon, a wish list on Amazon of all the para literature that was coming out by us that was Austin based. So whether it was wow. by either it w- somehow it was either inspired by Austin or it was a retelling or something, and the list just got obnoxiously long, and I can't keep up with it. So I do read Austin para literature on occasion, but it's is this the site where you started keeping track? on your most unreliable um, narrator that's my that's actually my website that's one of my websites but that's actually that's cool. a listing of all the austin and bronte television and movies that are available ah. for streaming okay no books. That's, i've linked to that though okay yeah that's i started as a librarian i track stuff it's part of my nature and i was curious to see how much content was out there on streaming on austin and the brontes and there's a lot there's i think over 180 200 different wow. tv shows and miniseries and movies all having to do with austin either retellings or para para literature movies or something having to do with it and then i organize because i am that person i organize it by streaming service uh, it's u.s based only I have to make that clear because I do have a lot of people who follow me from other countries who are like, oh, this is great. Oh, this is for U.S. stuff. So it is what it is. That gets updated quarterly. I used to update it more frequently, but yeah, it's... I'm impressed. (laughs) Thank you. That's a lot. That is a lot to keep up with. Yes. Yeah. That's the kind of, that whole side of doing... But I'm not an Austin super fan by any stretch of the imagination. Obviously. <laughs> you you oh, devote yeah. so little time and energy to it. Yeah. Wow. You're a real slacker there. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I'm worried. It's a funny thing because I do make fun of the Austin super fans. 
Me too. But there's there are different levels of super yeah. fanity. And there are different kinds too. Mm-hmm. There are the people who love to go to all the balls and dress up, which is amazing. But I don't think that's greater or lesser than the ones who just read all of the books and find all of the historical research. And there are people who do both. It's all, it's like apples and oranges. Everybody's just enjoying it. And that's to me, the main thing is Austin should be enjoyed. And yes, my pearls get clutched when I'm trying to look at how to phrase this politely. Do it. Just do it. Say All it. Right. My pearls get clutched when the uh, boomers get very upset about contemporary retellings of Austin. I I adored Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies, the movie. Yes. I just thought it was fantastic. So and much- I have my little pops here of <gasps> Lizzie and Darcy. Um, they live on my desk. Everybody needs um, a Funko Pop of Lizzie and Darcy. <laughs> yes. Enjoy the recent adaptation with Dakota Johnson of Persuasion. That is a definite mood killer if you talk about it in Austin groups, Austin circles. 2005 Pride and Prejudice to me trumps the 1995 version. Including Um, Colin Firth, though? He's hot. Don't get me wrong. It's just, I just, it just, I start clutching pearls because this is a hill I stand on. So cut me off if I get. Cut me yeah. off just if I get to be too indignant about it. The 2005 version tells the story of Pride and Prejudice from a view that makes Austin accessible to newer generations. You do you get the brilliance? Not really, but I also think the same could be said for the 1995 miniseries when people start talking about. Yeah, when people start arguing that 1995 version is better, I'm like, Darcy didn't come out of a lake wearing a wet shirt. I'm sorry, that just did not happen. So don't don't give me this argument that that version is better. Colin Um, Firth did get wet, though, didn't he? Yeah. In a white shirt, but but he didn't come out of the book. Oh, I thought, oh, in the book. Colin Firth definitely went into the lake and came out just like dripping hotness, but that didn't happen in the book. (laughs) Okay, no. It did not. Um, also, neither did Lizzie and Darcy make out on a table with the servants watching. It's all fine. It's a uh, 2005 version is my go-to movie. I keep a copy of it on my laptop. It's on my iPad. I watch it several times a year. I, To me, it's the message and not the medium. It's more important that people get Austin. She's never been out of print ever new generations are discovering her yep and it just drives me crazy when there's gatekeeping that happens because austin her book was popular literature and she should be for the masses and that's just quite simply put and the issue and maybe becca can speak on this too the issue with the genite community is if you're not more academic if you're not like living the Austin life rigorously, you're not a true Austin fan. A friend of mine is on the board for the New Jersey Janza chapter, and she wanted me to bring in, she wanted to bring me in as a presenter and talking about Austin and pop culture. And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. And the board knocked it down. They thought it was inappropriate. And my Jasna chapter, when I was living in Kentucky, same thing. I proposed uh, a telling on Austin and the pop culture and how she's been influential and what we can take from her today. And they voted that down as well. And they'd rather talk about lace making in Regency England than expand their opinions on Austin. And why can't we have both? This is, I'm going to read you guys a letter and Becky, you've probably already heard this. I'm going to read you guys a, an email that we got from listener Irina and it dovetails off of what Lisa was just saying. She writes, first, it occurred to me how modern are the problems and challenges that Emma faces compared to many other Austinian heroes. She doesn't need to find a good match. In fact, the decision to whom or even if to marry seems to be completely her own. She manages quite competently her household. And she has a lot of freedom in making decisions. 
Moreover, she's surrounded by people, both men and women, who respect and support her. What she struggles with is the lack of life experiences, the ability to read people's motivations and intentions, and some overconfidence in her own ability, pretty much what all of us go through at a certain age. I wonder if this modernity is what makes Emma so irritating for some people. It just hits too close to home. <laughs> and then she says, continuing this line of thought, I realize that Emma appears to be quite feminist in how female how her female characters handle themselves. For example, mm -hmm. for example, Jane Fairfax does not try to fi find a good match to settle down, but rather she is preparing to embark on an undesirable career to support herself. And how many current college grads face that same issue? And that also touches on another thing that I find fascinating about Austin is what she's actually writing and how we talk about her in pop culture. Mm. Uh, I think that a lot of times among Jane Knight's whether die hard or casual, there's kind of a fetishization of being a woman back then is like, it's all the pretty laces and you got to find a husband and all this stuff. And I'm like, if you read the books, they're actually very practical problems and solutions going on. And it's not all about, oh, I must find a rich husband. That would be nice. That is the yeah. fantasy. And th that does happen to a few of the characters like Lizzie, but there are practical day-to-day -day things that they're actually dealing with. Like, how do I deal with my nosy neighbors? And we've got to pay the cook <laughs> and the housekeeper and things like that. And it's not this, mm, I don't know how to describe it. There's, but there, there is a weird fetishization of just like, how feminine and dainty it is yeah. and how simple it all is. And talking about it as if it's more regressive than it actually is, you know, especially with the whole husband hunting thing, which is just like the people obsessed with that in the books are the ones who are wrong. Yes. Over so, and over again. Mrs. Bennett, like she's being kind of made fun of. She's not... The person leading the conversation of the book, she's the one that we're in conversation with as feminists trying to figure out how to navigate the world. So that's something that Arena's letter made me think of this time. No, yeah. Think. And what's interesting about Mrs. Bennett is um, oh, we could talk all day about her. Right. See, and I argue her and Mr. Bennett were in love. We, we are going to have to do another live stream post or midway through P Pride and Prejudice because I'm redoing it. That was my, Lisa, that was my first book on Craft Lit back in 2006. And oh. since then, I've gotten better at what I do. And since then, the readers we have access to have gotten better. So I'm rebooting all of that. That was going to be my next thing to do in between mm. books. But then I started Vindication on the Rights of Women because that seemed more useful. I still need to right read that. You don't need to. I read it to you. Just yeah. watch it on Craftlet because it is... The, okay, if you've ever read Nathaniel Hawthorne or Melville, she uses more commas and semicolons than they do. It but... took me an hour to figure out how to parse seven pages so that I could say them out loud in a way that made sense. So do not read it yourself. It would be a waste of your time. Instead, just follow the playlist over on Craftlet. And I'm not just tooting my own horn. I cannot imagine having to try and read that with the way our brains are all like me right now. Right. Not going to happen. But super important because, oh my God, Jane Austen gets her snark straight from Mary Wollstonecraft. She was in direct lines too. In there, friend, right? Yeah. No, like she actually does Mr. Collins' proposal, I'm a rational yeah. creature, hello? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. No, she does. And I think Pride and Prejudice is the only one where she makes a direct... I mean, that it's I... all over the place, but I think that's the only one that it's really fairly direct in. It makes sense, because, like, the themes of that book are very much about, like, women's education. Yeah, which is Mary Wollstonecraft's whole thing. But she is absolutely a snarkmeister in going after... Edmund Burke and this Talleyrand, this guy who dissed her publicly for her vindication of the rights of man, which she did first because 
he had thought that education and everything was really, and the French Revolution was really just for rich people. Mm-hmm. And she she had a little bone to pick with that. Yeah, she's our people. And she comes across as being, it's the preciousness thing I that I worried about because it's just like with Austin. She talks about like things like virtue and she talks about morals, but she's not talking about sexual morals or sexual virtue. She's talking about if you are going to expand your life and have a soul, a life of the mind, a life of the heart, a life at all, that's what she's calling virtue. And you're then restricting only that to men and men's education and then dissing women because all they are is empty headed fools because that's how you're training them. Then I don't think the women have the problem. Well, Woolen's Crocs cannot, does not have a leg to stand on about sexual morals. He just, no, nah. she couldn't. No, she, and that's my point is that she looks because you look at the pictures of her, she looks mm-hmm. all old fashioned and prim and proper. No. Mm-mm. No, she was out there. It's just that the language she's using is so old and creaky that it would be so easy to just read it and go, oh, I don't need to read any more of this. She's just going to be telling me not to fill in the blank when in fact she was really saying, no, you really should be doing all of the blanks and filling them in. Speaking of old and creaky language, I had read somewhere Austin was inspired by Tom Jones. I made my husband read it with me. Mm. I, go, I love your I husband. Got, oh, he hates me for this. I got, I don't know, quarter of the way through and I'm like, I can't take this. I just can't do it. And he read the entire thing. And God bless him. Yeah. He's, I'll never do this again with you. There's, you're not <laughs> recommending another book. And I was like. Did he see any parallels? He doesn't like Austin. <laughs> oh, Oh, it must be love. Then you can keep coming over here and getting your Austin Austin fix. <laughs> That's fine. I understand. I don't know how you do it, but okay. I, I think I can deal with indifferent, but I I think hate is maybe good. hate is too strong of a word. Bees, yeah, we work. We've been we've known each other for twenty seven years and been together for eighteen. Well um, done. I think. Yeah, we work as a couple, but we have. Very divergent taste in quite a lot of things. And on one hand, it is a good thing because we learn from each other and we right. influence each other, but we don't talk about Austin. She's definitely not a common topic in our household, which is fine. So that's fine. We'll let it go. We'll still like him. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> no one is perfect. <laughs> no. He did, but he did read Tom Jones, which is really something. That- I cannot imagine that book has aged well, yeah. especially post 2016 I just don't see how that book could be okay anymore that Mall Flanders there's a whole mess load of books that I think that window windows on those closed for craft lit but I do want to show you this at at least the first part of a video clip there's several different clips that I've that I pieced together and they all come from uh, the Morgan Library in New York City back in 2010 they did a like kind of a retrospective thing on Austin and they had some of her letters there and all of this kind of thing. And then um, they brought in authors and writers, mostly authors, writers, and actors who came in and talked about why they loved Austin. But the opening one is the one that surprised me the most. And this is not the entire clip. This is just a piece of it, but I could not help myself. I really wanted to share this with you. All right. I am hoping that the sound will work. So let's pray. How you doing, my brother? God bless you. What is your favorite Austin novel? Or character? And why? I would say with B.M., I think M is not just a masterpiece, much like Chekhov's Three Sisters. It's the fusion, I think, of her own sense of suspicion of conventional morality on the one hand, but also knowing you can't have an isolated quest for individual will independent of a social context that could lead toward either disaster or even a cynicism of soul. And you get this wonderful fusion of Emma where she actually remains Socratic. She is involved in a quest and a seeking of self-knowledge. And yet at the same time, she recognizes she must acknowledge the social context. She can't be a kind of sentimental subversive, nor should she be a conformist who is deferential to custom. 
so that you get a fusion in Emma. And in so many ways, I think that that is her masterpiece. Do you have a least favorite novel, and why? Is there any novels that you think don't quite work? No, I tend to be a Jane Austen freak, I think. Certainly politically, I wish she and I would have been on very different sides of the fence, as it were. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's unappealing. I just say I put it in context and recognize it as the grand genius that she was. She was like all great artists, not simply a transcender of her age, but also a child of her age. So she was able to transcend her age in writing works that are timeless, which is to say they have something to say for every time. But she's also a human being. She's a child of her age. British imperialism, the patriarchy that still she's wrestling with. Many of her characters, of course, quite famously wrestling with marriage as the end all and be all in a certain sense, even though within that marriage you want self-realization, self-fulfillment. So there's a number of different uh, political aspects that I would clash with Jane Austen. I'm a deep Democrat with tilts toward always focusing on the poor and the least of these as both Christian and, uh, and deep Democrat. She also Christian, it was very interesting. She's a Christian stoic. I'm much more of a Christian Chikovian. And that's an interesting juxtaposition we need not get into at the moment. But I, I've got some deep differences with her, even as I acknowledge her unadulterated genius. It must be said that one of the great oppositions in the modern world is the opposition between Jane Austen and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson, New World, American, preoccupied with self-creation, self-refashioning, the imagination playing a fundamental role in reshaping self and world, always suspicious of constraints, always trying to transgress and transform and transcend constraints. Jane Austen, constraints, suspicious of transgression, suspicious of the imagination running too wild, resulting in a transcendence of constraints. Emma, the masterpiece of Jane Austen, a balance between constraints and will and imagination. Ralph Waldo Emerson, always suspicious of constraints, which means that the world of Jane Austen will always be too narrow, too pinched, too circumscribed. And like Prometheus, Ralph Waldo Emerson wants to break out fascinating tension between the two. I happen to be in love with both of them. So I'm going to pause there. There are some other clips, but I thought Cornell West, as much as he loves Emma and Jane Austen, missed some of the subversive things that are going on in Jane Austen. And admittedly, this was 10 years ago, and most of the books that I have been reading, post-colonial Jane Austen is an older one, but Morality and Conversation in Austen, and there are several other ones that are that really look at the history. Like the first, what was it, the first two episodes of Emma that we did on Craftlet, where I had just downloaded out of my brain a whole dumpster load of new scholarship on Austen. She was so edgy in so many ways and the in fact there was one person who wrote in saying something about Mr. Elton that Mr. Elton no it wasn't it was about the Gilbert Markham in Tenant of Wildfell Hall being a gentleman farmer and Robert Martin in Emma being a tenant farmer Except that Mr. Knightley calls Robert Martin a gentleman. I'm sorry, they're both gentlemen farmer. Knightley calls Robert Martin a gentleman farmer when he's not the landowner. And that this would have been a subversive act. This would have been Knightley breaking rules in society to point out to the readers through Jane Austen, but also in the book, no, this is a good guy. This is a stand-up guy, and he's going to be great for Harriet. And and I think people, it took me a while to, to read up on this. I think people think that was a mistake. Like, he should have been a tenant farmer instead of a gentleman farmer. But I think that's just another one of Austin's, like, little stick I, I have so many thoughts. I have so many thoughts. Yes, I absolutely love that. And the whole idea of a gentleman in name versus a gentleman in soul and action. And I totally agree with Cornell West that, 
Emma is Jane Austen's masterpiece because she is doing so much with it. She's so ambitious and so successful with it. And I think a lot of what she is doing, particularly with Mr. Knightley, is I think she's writing her ideal man. Yes. Because so many of her books are through the male characters, she is showing you what is worthy, like what is worth your time, girls, but also just what is a good man? What are the qualities to look for? And so you see like in Northanger Abbey and Pride and Prejudice and all these others, like a a gentleman, not just in name, he's a good dancer, even if he doesn't particularly like it. He's well-read. He is concerned with the people in his family and his community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're reading through Emma, you're just like, okay, check, check. Mr. Knightley, he dances, he reads poetry. He's very involved with his community and his loved ones. And he is always looking out for people. And okay, Mr. Knightley is like her blueprint. For, okay, look for a person like this. But going back to West a little bit, I think when he's talking about Austin and Emerson and constraint versus transcendence, he's missing gender. Yes. Because they are able to do those very different things in very different ways only because of who they are. Like Austin cannot transcend like Emerson because she is a woman in a man's world. Yeah. Writing books that are being read by more than just women. Um, they're being read by the Prince Regent. <laughs> yes. Who she didn't so. like. She did not, and she has to be very careful. And there are just things that a male writer can do that a female writer can't. But I think that challenge is something that just pushes her to be greater because the subversion is so subtle and so well done and so thoughtful. Um, okay, I will let y'all talk now. I, um, I think that's why it's so modern. Keep going, Lisa. Okay, yeah, I was just thinking when he was talking about like Austin with British imperialism and colonialism and this and then, and I'm like, has he not read Mansfield Park? Right. She's completely rejecting the whole idea of slavery in the West Indies. And in Emma too. In Emma. Yeah, and one of her brothers was an abolitionist. So I think he's doing Austin a little disservice. Mm -hmm. She rejects a lot of things in her novels and so you have to excuse me it's Mansfield Park is not a favorite so I haven't read it in a very long time it's nobody's favorite let's be honest but, nobody here well, all right good she skewers like North Northanger Abbey was her skewering against gothic novels as an example she there's so much that Austin skewers she rejects and that's what makes her one of the things that makes her timeless is just that she's we can read Emma and we can see how the youth of today are acting. They're rejecting us older generations very easily, just as Emma was rejecting the older generations in her family and yeah. in her communities. Yeah, I think Cornell West is a brilliant man, but he just missed the mark on a few things. And I think so. this really, sh no, I think it's, that's right. I think it really shows the difference that 14 years can make too, because the a lot of the scholarship that I was reading from, like one of the things, I don't know if you caught this in, or if you remember this from Emma, I certainly didn't catch it my first seven times through, was Mrs. Elton, who we all love to hate, who as listener Kathy says, Mrs. Bates or Miss Bates cares about everybody, talks about everybody. Mrs. Elton only cares about herself, only talks about ways about herself in ways that elevate herself in at least in her own standing and tries to do it in others and that is Jane Austen's point it's you can be talkative and that's fine or you can be talkative and destructive and Miss Bates is on the positive side but the one of the reasons I brought Mrs. Elton Miss yeah Mrs. Elton up is because at the very beginning when everybody's oh my, my goodness Mr. Elton is getting married <gasps> what's going on comma, her family's in business in Bristol, comma. What we didn't know, what I certainly didn't know, is that Bristol was one of the port towns where slaves came in. That was one of the hubs of the slavery market. And so when, I didn't know that. when somebody is like from Bristol back then, it would have been a code for if they're in business, mm -hmm. that, that's pretty much all you need to know. And we lose so much of that context 
And I wouldn't have, the annotated version that I got of Emma came out within the last five years. I would never have known otherwise. And I don't know if anybody who lives, who's our age or younger living in England would necessarily even know unless they studied it, which makes me happy. And you, oh, Lisa, you have to show everybody your shirt. Oh. Uh, I love that. Um, I was debating on wearing it because it's a Pride and Prejudice quote from Lady Catherine de Berg. But in a lot of ways, Emma is an absent headstrong girl. She's doing her thing. She's her goal in life is to match, make, and make everybody happy. She's she like we talked about earlier. She doesn't have to worry about finding a suitor. She's well taken care of. She's beloved by her family. She can pretty much do whatever she wants, which is the antithesis of women her age, 20, 18, 19, 20. Yep. Um, during the Regency era. Yeah, Emma is totally an absent headstrong girl. Yeah, I knew the shirt had to be worn. Yeah, that was a good one. And Becca, you have another one that I think. I do. Mine says bookmarks are for quitters. And this is actually from craftlet friend Amy Woolwine's Etsy <gasps> show. So oh, everyone go over there my... to Jenny's designs. And I think you have it linked on your website, don't you, Heather? I do. And I'm going to add. Uh... Over there. She's got great stuff. <laughs> I'm going to add a link in this, the show notes to this episode too, because she does. She has a lot of good bookish stuff. And some Austin stuff as well, if I remember. Yeah. And even Emma, because she yeah. did the Emma bags That's for us. Right. Yeah. And also going back again. Yeah. When Wes talks about like the sexual politics of Jane Austen, missing something else there, mm -hmm. which is that. The sexual politics of that are not always about Jane Austen's view. They're mm -hmm. usually about the social climate. She's actually surprisingly not judgmental of fallen women or whatever you say. She's just pointing out society is really hard on them. And so that's yeah. why we want to be careful. And yeah. even like the rakish characters, she's not saying it's bad that they're out there having sex. She's saying that it's bad that they're out there having irresponsible sex and ruining young women's lives. Yeah. So I think that is also something that kind of gets lost. And maybe she was a prude. I don't know. But knowing some of the jokes that she made in her books and outside, probably mm -hmm. yeah. just much more concerned with this is the reality that we are living in, unfortunately, still today to a certain degree. And as women, we got to deal with it. It would have been hard it. Yes. It's a perfect example of that. Somewhere, I don't know if it's a direct quote, she's described as a flirt. She runs off with Wickham. Her and Kitty are totally yucking it up with the uh, regiments that are coming into town. That's in Lydia trying to live her best life is in Austin's time reflecting poorly on her family. And that's something that Darcy brings up. I know we keep talking about Pride and Prejudice. I'm sorry. That's fine. <laughs> It's all good. That's something that Darcy brings up is that Lizzie's association with her family and the way that her family is portrayed makes her a less than desirable partner. And I think, oh my gosh, like I said, I haven't read Emma in a million years, but Jane Fairfax has seen that as well. Do I have the right character? And Emma gets a little snobby about it as well, if I recall correctly, but she gets over herself eventually. Yeah, she, she gets edgy about different things with Jane Fairfax. I think the thing that always surprised me was was Emma's ain't no thing attitude to Harriet not knowing who her parents were. Yeah. The, and so the assumption is that she's only got one and that's not somebody who was married. And yet, even though Emma is the the queen of the ball at in Highbury, she's still really fiercely Harriet's friend. She's a little nuts to think that Harriet and Knightley could ever get together and have it be okay on Knightley's side of things. But um, I think that was all her own insecurities. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think so, too. But and I think it was also there was something about Emma seeing the two of them getting along together that made her just so unjustly happy. Until she realized that, no, it's Harriet's actually got a crush on him that's bad but but he just dismissed Harriet for so long during what two-thirds of the book 
And then he's like, no, actually, you did a really good job helping her grow up some. Now you just have to grow up some yourself. <laughs> so are we going to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the 2020 adaptation of Emma? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, start with it. You start. I actually really enjoyed it. There were only a couple of moments where I was just like, what the heck are you doing? To me, the importance of an adaptation is not that it be 100% accurate word for word, but that it capture the spirit and the heart of the story, which I thought that movie did pretty well. And I really loved the emphasis that it put on Harriet and Emma's friendship, which I think often gets just played for comedy or overlooked, but that had some lovely weight. My main issues with that movie I had to, no, one of my friends, she's obsessed with the idea that Knightley was out there running in the streets. She just is, that's too far. And I'm like, it's fine. They made him a younger man, whatever. It fits with the tone of the movie. For me, I didn't like how John Knightley was portrayed. I thought they made him more like the annoyed husband in Sense and Sensibility instead of like Mr. John Knightley, who loves his family and He's just cranky because he can't just be with his family at home. But the thing that really got me was the nosebleed. I remember I was sitting in the theater. I was watching it. This was like two days before we went into lockdown, by the way. Oh, my goodness. I know. I, I was watching it, and that happened. And I literally leaned forward and whispered, what the hell? Because <laughs> it just was so out of nowhere and out of the blue and I was like, okay, in that moment, the movie was clearly very uncomfortable with sincerity and felt like it needed to undercut this iconic moment and very heartfelt scene. And I was just like, so close to the landing. Um, but overall, I thought it was fun. Like, obviously, the clothing <laughs> is a whole separate issue, but I also really love A Knight's Tale. So like, I can hand wave it. It's fine. Which part of the clothing did you were you not into? Because at uh, least they wore hats. They did wear hats, but there were just like some weird things. Like she would walk around with a detached collar just as a necklace or something. And I remember there was a lot of discussion about it, like on historical clothing and Austin YouTube. And I was like, it's fine. People were upset about it. I wasn't that much because I was just like, they're going for a visual style. Yeah. Which I don't yeah. mind. What did you think, Lisa? That was all right. It's okay. I can like that. And you can like 2005 Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> yeah. I have Phil's uh, stand on. Don't forget, I like the 2002 version of Persuasion. So let's not forget that yes, one. Yes. And I think um, we're all. The, is this Amanda? I mean, the 2022 version? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a whole rant about Persuasion adaptations, but continue. That's... This is what makes the community so great is you start, you, you have your hills you stand on and you need to bring it if you are standing on that hill. No, Emma was enjoyable. I liked the, I liked how they lit the scenes. Emma is a very bright, cheerful character. The clothing she wore was very bright. They made Anya Taylor-Joy very well lit, like she Emma doesn't live in shadows. She's very much, she has a bubbly personality. She's very much out there. And I like the way they portrayed her as that personality and character in the movie. I agree with Becca, the nosebleed thing. I was like, yeah. what's this? The thing yeah. that has always they made Knightley a little bit younger. It's always creeped me out how much older he was than her. But at the same time, I had to reconcile that was the period. It is what it is. But that doesn't mean I'm still not. My husband's grandmother was 17 years apart from her husband. And that yeah, was, she just died, I don't know, 10 years ago. Yeah. I was seven years older than my husband. So I guess there's that. But now we would call what Knightley was doing with Emma grooming. Would we, so we got actually doing grooming? Or would we just call it grooming because he's older? Because I don't think his behavior or treatment toward Emma is in any way trying to endear himself or set him up as some great authority figure. I think he's just a really good friend to her, but they happen to have 16 years apart and they happen to fall in love. 
So it's, I don't it's think interesting he's actually too, grooming, but I think people often think he is just because he's older and he's known her since she was a child. Well, and I think yeah. we have the benefit because Lisa didn't just finish the book with us that the my my vibe, I think all of our vibes for so long had been this is creepy and just a little too much. But Not there are several fine. points. Yeah, you're different. I read you're Elsie Finmore, which was actually grooming. So this is oh, okay. Yeah, no, this is no. But the thing that I thought was interesting was that more more often than not, when Knightley is like being critical or whatever, you can tell if you go back, but you can also tell even at the end that he was in no way doing any of that, expecting anything. Mm -hmm. There was no point in time where and anywhere up until the last, what is it, the last four chapters in the book when he finally breaks down and goes, oh my God, I have to admit to myself that I love you. Up until that point, he had all sorts of assumptions that she was going to, especially marry Frank Churchill. And he was surviving that just fine. There was no weird bitterness up until the point that he found out that Frank had been a jerk and that Jane had been lying with Frank and then... Lying with Frank. <laughs> li lying with Frank and lying with Frank. Maybe. But, but I do think it bears rereading those last few chapters to see how Knightley doesn't present as a groomer because yeah. I was surprised and in it, reading it again I can agree with that I think Becca made a great point it's and I think that's something that kind of we kind of need to think about that when we're talking about Austin is that what was the norm for the Regency era is would be seen quite differently today and the nuances Heather that you just mentioned about how Knightley was a friend to her. He wasn't getting butt hurt because she may have ran off with Churchill. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of the conversations when yeah. we talk about Austin is the nuance. And I think that's important. I think that's why the manga and the graphic novels and the retellings exist because we have to convey Austin's worth in a way that makes it, I hate to say it, as palpable for contemporary minds. And in a way, it's a shame. Is I have it a really funny or recognizable. Both. Okay. I have a really funny comment. I was, I'm a bookseller also by trade, and I was working at a bookstore about 10, 15 years ago. And I am shelving books, and these two teenagers are walking by, and they're like, oh man, I don't want to read Austin. It's old English. And I'm like, like gosh. Oh, I was just gosh. like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to. I, <laughs> I desperately wanted to pull them aside. I'm like, can we talk about linguistics here? Because Austin is not. I mean, even Chaucer isn't old English, right? He's middle English. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Early contemporary English starts with Shakespeare. Yeah. And then and then it and then it becomes more modern as you get to Austin and later. But yeah, Chaucer is middle English and Jane is definitely not old. But it's the use of language, which also changed. We can look at Jane, or we can, yeah, we can look at Austin's work from a linguistics point of view and how she uses language is completely different and how we use it today, which I think for some people, like Heather, you just said, it may not be recognizable. Yeah. And so lying with Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, <laughs> that is exactly what's propelled Craftlet for so long. Mm -hmm is that there's always another book where it's, oh, we think we know this book, but I I'm going to do the heavy lift and bring the research to you so that you can get all the inside jokes that we just miss. Because mm -hmm. we do. And it's not, it's, I get unhappy when I hear the, not just the Janeites, but all the other English teachers, because I used to teach English, but all the other English teachers and not even English teachers, English professors who get very locked into their own track, not Barkas, who <laughs> rocks my world. She is all over the place and she, loves all the adaptations and retelling and, and everything. And you can tell when you read her books that she's just like Jane Love. Yes. But I think that the it makes me sad when people are willing to sacrifice the joy of the book and the limitations, therefore, that they're placing on it. To them, it's a very narrow kind of joy. When I feel like we're all talking about much more expansive, like, we're seeing all these connections out from Jane Austen, whether it's historical parallels or contexts or modern parallels or contexts. It all, it all goes to the same happy place. And it makes me so sad when people won't go there. I don't know if you guys can see this. We got, this was sent by listener Carrie. And this, 
she sent it because to her, this was an homage to Mr. Woodhouse, which again, it's one of those things do not change. People really do not change how we say things that might change. But even then, I don't see any relation to his hypochondria. No, was, but he, yeah, keep going. So when they go to Donwell Abbey for the picnic in honor of Mrs. Elton, haha, Mr. Woodhouse comes along and he's not really the type to go and sit out under a shade tree in the heat and all of that. But Mr. Knightley, knowing him so well, has prepared something to amuse him. He's gotten out all of these like old things from the family collection, like old medals or, or pictures and things like that. Just a curiosity bunch of small cabinet. objects, curiosities, and laid them out so that Mr. Woodhouse can sit inside by the fire, away from the drafts, with someone beside him. Usually it's Mrs. Weston because she's also not out traipsing around at the moment. And just look them over and enjoy talking about it and staring at everything. And so it's a, a collection of small objects. I have some dates for you. March 29th, 1815 is when okay. Emma was finished. Okay. So that means next year is its 210th anniversary. It looks like I have wow. to write something special for thee. And then July 6th is the day that Mr. Knightley proposes to Emma. The reason why I have these dates, I have a ton of, I have a content calendar and over time I started collecting. Oh, and the book was actually published December 23rd, 1815 by John Murray. So I have a lot of crazy dates such as when Anne Elliot was born and Harriet Smith was born June 23rd because there's a lot of Austin fans out there who read of a very nuanced book and they will pinpoint the dates of when specific things happen. And so I thought it'd be super cool that for my Austin empire that I can celebrate those days as well. So for example, on the day of that nightly proposes to Emma, I wrote a newsletter issue on engagement in the Regency era. And people also enjoy the fact like, how did you know that date was? Don't look at me. Somebody else took the time and energy to do well, this. Also, it's all there in Austin's text. Yeah. yeah. Somebody yeah, just I mean, it out. There was a person that I followed on Instagram that every month she published uh, a calendar of what happened in Austin's world on that particular day and that month. Her actual world, like Jane Austen's world, not the and, lives of her characters. No, both. Both. Oh my goodness. It was an intense calendar. She blocked me for some reason. I'm sure yeah, it was an accident. I ac huh? I'm sure it was an accident. Oh, for sure. It was annoying because she was we'll following say. me. It was annoying because she was following me and, and then she blocked me. Yeah, I tried to get sneaky and created a uh, ghost account. And, and she had asked me a question when I had started following her and she saw what I did. And she goes, just as long as you credit me, she goes, I've put a lot of work into this. And I, and I, I totally get it. My running my little Austin empire is a lot of work and collecting these dates of when specific things happen. A lot of it is happenstance. A lot of it is me researching it, but tying in with our conversation, I think readers, whether or not they're Janites or beginning Janites or what have you, really do like this information because it gives them a connection to Austin's work that the book doesn't give them. Knowing history on how engagements were done during the Reg Regency mm -hmm. era, that's new knowledge. Maybe it's just me. Yeah. I don't know. I like this information. I just assume others like it too. No, that's the whole craftlet gig. It's the same thing. In fact, next time you do posts on anything, especially Austin or Bronte, make sure that you give me the link in advance of it going out so I can pimp it out in the craftlet world too. Because my people would definitely love to read what you're reading if they're not already on your reading list. Yeah, the big, I think the big thing that I'd want to promote, Excessively Diverting is on Linktree. So you can find me all across the interwebs via my Linktree and make it all in one place. But the one thing that um, I would promote is my TikTok where I'm reading Pride and Prejudice because my goal 
oh. is to read all of Austin's books. And like I said, I'm doing it with commentary and swears. Um, and because it's giving me the opportunity. Uh, should be the TikTok icon. Ooh. So right next to the YouTube one. Oh, there we go. Uh -oh. oh, I need mean, something went wrong. Oh, uh, it's probably be me. Either way, though, I wanted people to see your link tree. Yeah, the surprising thing is I only have 66 followers, but I get nearly a thousand views. Nice. When I read a chapter. So I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Algorithm. Oh, nice. Nice. That's when Heather emailed us and she's like, yeah, pimp this out on social media. I was like, gotta make a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, like I said, life has been lifing the last couple of months. So I haven't been keeping up with my reading. And I have, I'm like, hey, I know I haven't been reading. I'm coming back to that. But if you want to have an in-depth conversation about Emma, come join me on Craftlet. So hopefully some of the viewers tonight are coming across from, from TikTok or various other socials that I've posted on. Awesome. That would be excellent. Because there's, it's so hard, the benefit of when people find Craftlet, I've got 18 years of content. Mm -hmm. So it's not like anybody has to wait for chapters. Although when they were doing, we're doing a book live, then they do because I do it serially. Like you're doing Pride and Prejudice or the way Charles Dickens used to publish his books. The every week you get a different chapter or Alexandre Dumas did the same thing, which is hard for some people. And so they hoard all the episodes and I'll get all of a sudden this rash of emails or phone messages and it's out. Oh, people are catching up now. We're at the mid book point. So I know what's going on. One thing that really annoys me about the serials is Amazon is discontinuing Vila, which was how people were presenting their work in serial format because the idea was, oh, Dickens did it and right. all these authors did it and they enjoyed it and people like not everybody wants to binge. And if you read yeah. an entire book, that's essentially binging. And when I found out before I started my my smut empire that they're just continuing Vila, I was like, it. I love it. Oh my goodness. The more I learn about you, the more I like you. <laughs> Is it going to live anywhere else Is it, since it's not going to be on Amazon? I, I don't know. Like if you're talking about Vila itself, I have no idea what they're doing. As far as my work goes, the smut um, hasn't been published yet. Interestingly enough, I have not written a single piece of Austin paraliterature or anything inspired by her. It was like the whole Austin tattoo situation. I didn't get, I've been getting tattoos for about 20, 25 years now. I'm old. I got, I finally got in my Austin tattoo this past summer and I had a lot of friends who were shocked. They were like, why have you not gotten an Austin tattoo? I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know. It's hard because she has so many great quotes. Yeah. It's so. Sad. That is true. I am looking to see. No, I'm not going to. One of the other comments that I got, I'm looking for it, again, talking about nuance and how uh, it's easy for people to to miss mm -hmm. some of the things that probably would have been, if not important to people in Jane Austen's time, at least recognized in Jane Austen's time. We got a an email recently from an anonymous listener who said, I've really enjoyed listening to Emma. I read it years ago and I thought I knew the book, but I was wrong. There's only one comment. Robert Martin and Mr. Elton are turned down when they propose, both of them. But Mr. Elton tries to put Emma down after. We never hear Robert Martin behaving poorly. It points out who the true gentleman really is. And then she adds at the end, can you just imagine Mr. Elton's face at the wedding? And I was thinking, no, I can't. But boy, do I wish I could go back in time to see it. Mr. Elton is an incel. Oh, I'm my God, that. right? Oh yes. yeah, he he is a not all men man. Yes, and I think I think contemporary people reading that are going to immediately pick up on that. Yeah, speaking of nuance, we're going to see a lot of reflection of how we perceive ourselves in society today, which again just rolls back into what makes Austin timeless. Exactly. In fact, 
Oop, keep talking, Becca. I'm going to share something else and it's going to take me a sec oh. to pull it up. I was really only just saying people are people. And we like to think that we have changed so much over the decades or centuries, but essentially we are the same, even if society changes around us. That is agreed. That is definitely true. All right. This is, this is a section of the video where they, there's an Irish writer who makes a comment that I just can't not share, but then there it's the dinner party conversation that everybody, who would they invite? If you said you were going off for the weekend and you're doing nothing except rereading Emma or taking Mansfield Park to bed, that image for me would be one of pure happiness. You could bring maybe a person to bed and that might be nicer in some way, but it wouldn't be as fully satisfying. If I were giving a dinner party and Austin was coming, I'd put Freud on one side of her and Jung on the other. And I would want to include Mary Wollstonecraft. I'd like to hear her and Charlotte Bronte talk about things. If I had Jane Austen to dinner, I wouldn't invite anyone else. Emily Dickinson, she didn't go out so much, but let's say that she did. There's only one figure who would, I think, treat her in the way in which she deserved, and that's my dear Anton Chekhov. And I would really lock them there for the evening, and I would, I'd feed them quite a lot of alcohol. It would be very interesting to know what Austen would make of Freud, as she discovered slowly what Freud actually was proposing. Well, Austin did brew beer. By the way, I the mean, quote that's still on the screen is, of all the great writers, she is the most difficult to catch in the act of greatness, and that's from Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. She makes it look easy. And I thought Woolf was not a fan. I thought she and um, Twain were both of the same. A apparently, I haven't read a whole lot on Virginia Woolf except for knowing about this quote. But I do know that there's some conversation about the Twain thing, whether or not that was him trying to needle a friend of his who was a huge Jane Austen fan who wrote, I think it was the guy who started the Atlantic Monthly. And that was Twain just trying to get his goat. And so the, but those letters wind up, wind up getting published and people paid more attention to Twain's than to the conversation, whether okay. that's true yeah. or not, I don't know, but, but it broke my heart to think between the conversation between Charlotte Bronte and Austin right? would be amazing. I would want to be a fly in the wall with my cup of cider, hard cider. Yes, and, thank uh, you. Strongbow. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm a snob. We only do local cider. I'm in oh, apple country, you know. lucky. I have um, one Pennsylvania down east cider that I have access to, but everything else I have to... Meh. And that's oh, on draft. there's a... That's, uh, there's several, for my birthday a couple of years ago, we did a cidery tour mm. and one of my favorite cideries makes a cherry apple cider that my husband and I buy by the case. So I might crack one open tonight. Anyways, okay. yeah, Bronte and, and Austin would just be, I think the bra the, when I collate my content for my social media for, it, it, it's supposed to be Austin and Bronte. But the problem is Brontes, the Brontes themselves, despite their own genius, are not as, I want to say well endowed, but that's not what I'm looking for, are as well thought of in terms of their stories as Austin is. And they thought, you know, Austin was just romantic fluff. They didn't, yeah. they just were not a fan of her. And it's interesting because I really hate Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre. Uh, I recently reread uh, a telling of Jane Eyre from the point of view of Bertha. And so I'm like, Mr. Rochester can go rotten hell. So I don't understand. <laughs> Jane is all about the Mr. Rochester business. Oh, and I think Bronte is the most interesting. Yeah. But I still was like my thought process on Tolkien, I think. He's a shit writer. I can't stand 30 pages of and we're walking and we're walking and we're walking. But I have to give him massive props for what he's done. He's a father yeah. of contemporary fantasy. I'm not going to deny the man those accolades. He created languages. He was a linguist for fuck's sake. And so the same thing with the Brontes. I think they're fully underappreciated, even though by, but their work drives me crazy. <laughs> I, I have to read this other quote to you from, from one of our listeners. Christine sent this in. 
She, family friend, recently took Janier in his homeschool high school tutorial. He decided to tease his classmates each week about all the ways that they did not, in fact, want to date Mr. Rochester in real life. I oh, guess I friends don't let friends date Byronic boyfriends. Okay. I love it. I have to plug. Do it. Another YouTuber. She hasn't been posting lately, but she's got all her stuff still up. Amrita by the book on YouTube. She did a series of, I think she called them bad news lovers, where <laughs> she talked about classical romantic heroes like Mr. Darcy and Mr. Rochester and why you really don't want to date them. Excellent. <laughs> I love it. And like, so Looking delightful. Out. Like you you gotta read it or watch it. Excellent. Yeah. I'll be posting out to that from the show notes down below. Love it. Absolutely love it. Needs to happen. Yeah, I think. And I'm, uh, and I'm a big fan of the Byronic hero myself. But I don't not know, as a date. No. Not as a husband, not as a, per a permanent partnership. Maybe he's a one night well, stand. Oh, hell yes. Yeah, he's a total fuck boy. That's he's, the thing. He's, oh, yeah. Yeah, Heather, I hope there? you don't mind. I'm dropping the F-bomb over here. You can totally edit me out. I have a sign that somebody, that a listener, Anne, made me that says, I swear like a well-educated sailor. So. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah, oh, there's, I'll have to look it up. And I'll do this right now while I'm running my mouth. There's a mystery series where Jane Austen is a vampire. <gasps> and there's only three books. Is it? And this is not um, the new Pride and Prejudice in Space. Because I agree with you about zombies. I'm not sure about no. the space one. No, I did see that. I did see that. The author is Michael Thomas Ford. Okay. Um, and I think the first book in the series is called Jane Bites Back. And she plays a she plays, she's Jane Austen, but in this book, she's known as Jane Fairfax because she actually owns a bookstore in upstate New York. And so all these various literary characters come in and out of her life because they're the undead. And that includes Jane uh, and Jane herself. And Byron has been essentially lusting after her for 200 years. And she keeps she keeps turning him down. Just the really teasing. sad part is the, the books are really well written, but there's only three of them. And I was very disappointed after I mainlined all three. And then I found out that there was no more. And I was like, oh, that's a bummer. This would have been a great series. I would have totally, I, I just, para, Austin Paraliterature is hit or miss. There's a lot of people who write it, who probably should stick to a Wattpad, but don't. And there's others who just knock it out of the park. And when there's, like I mentioned earlier, Curtis Sittenfeld's retelling of Pride and Prejudice in contemporary era where Lizzie and Darcy are having hate sex is fantastic. I like Curtis's work as well on its own, but it's sometimes the work is fantastic and other times you're left. Yeah. I just got an email or a voicemail today right before I got on the call from Tammy. And she was, she called in to say before the live stream that uh, she just saw a book pop up on her, I think it was her Libby app. It's just come out. It's a 2024 book by Vanessa Kelly called Murder in Highbury. And I can't tell if it's a cozy mystery or if it's just a mystery, murder mystery, but it picks up where Emma left off. And before I forget, I think somebody needs to check me on this. I think the actor who plays Knightley up against Anya Taylor-Joy mm -hmm. is actually 36. Because I saw the two of them interviewed together over and over again, and he is quite definitely there. Because it's cute, they're probably playing up the fact that their age is separate, but they're basically the correct ages. Mm -hmm. Which blew um, okay, my mind, so... because he seems way younger than like Colin Firth or anybody else. But Any, yeah, I was shocked. Um, so ch Jennifer somebody needs Ely... to check me on that. All right, Jennifer Ely and Colin Firth were actually very close in age, whereas mm -hmm. I don't think actual, I think Jane is, what, one in 20 or two in 20? Emma's, mm -hmm. Emma's Lizzie. 21. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Lizzie is like one in 20 or two in 20. But yes, yep. to answer your question, how they're Murder and Highbury, Vanessa Kelly, it is a mystery series. A series? Picking, it picking up, like you had said, after, at the end of Emma. 
And she becomes going from clever matchmaker to Regency England's Buddhist. <laughs> oh, excuse me, Buddhist sleuth. So interesting. So she's Miss Marple will... in in on pure waste. And I, I actually do have on Libby. You can tag books, specific tags. And I do have an Austin tag, so I will add that to that tag. Excellent. So read Excellent. at another time. Yeah, and I'll put all of these in the in the description box below. Yeah. And for anyone interested in Austin pair literature, Austin Prose is a really great I think she has a website and also she's on Goodreads. So I follow on Goodreads and I'm always seeing want to read, just finished, like all these books related to Austin based on Austin. So that's why I recognize a lot of these titles. I'm just like, oh yeah, Laurel read that. <laughs> yeah, I have every book that I read that's either Austin or somehow related to Austin, whether it's a retelling, inspiration or whatever, is on my Goodreads as Austin-esque. Just so that I have a terrible habit of checking out books I've already read, so I need to cross and slam Goodreads more often. <laughs> I, just read, I just read 84 Tarring Crossroad which I actually turned out I read earlier last year and I read so much that I completely forgot. I was like, this book sounds familiar. How did Why? you like it? Are you... How'd you like it? It was it fine. Again? It was fine. I don't know. <laughs> I, my general, there's, as far as my reading habits go, I tend to, on Goodreads, I tend to rate fours and fives depending upon the book itself. If it's fine, it gets a three. If it's really good enough that I'm going to want to continue on with the series or maybe read more by the author. It gets a four. I guess a five, it's chef's kiss. Yeah. Like yeah. So, if it's five, it spoke to my soul. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It transcends something important. I I agree with that. I, it's the same way I feel about scoring and rating movies and TV shows too. It's my first question is, could I tell what they were trying to do? And if I could, did they accomplish it? Yes. Speaking of which, thoughts on Netflix rebooting Pride and Prejudice. What? Again? You haven't heard this? No. Oh my gosh. This just came out I may last have, but I, I also just get, I get tired. Okay. I love Jane Austen and I love the Jane Austen adaptation, but I am so tired. I'm like, there are so many other great books to adapt. And a lot of times they will do a Jane Austen book when I'm like, you clearly want to be doing this book. Yeah. <laughs> Why not just do that book? But Austen's name is so well recognized that yeah. this will just redo Austen or I'll even publishers will be like, we'll make this author do an Austen book. And it's there are other stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, Netflix yeah. is rebooting Pride and Prejudice. It's going to be a mini series. Oh my God. It is being written by, I can see her name. She's a British author, so hopefully there'll be some more British isms attached to it. That's something. Um, no idea if it's going to be period or contemporary. I get excited Happy because fun. I be, enjoy it. I I get excited because I'm always curious to see how bad they're going to mangle it, and then I can run my mouth about it on social media. And so that's when I went and saw. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, I was the only one in the theater. I went opening day. And I was the only one in the theater. I'm quite proud of that, by the way. I had the opposite experience. Be. I actually got to see a preview screening when I was in college. It was a packed house <gasps> and everyone was just having the time of their life. It's the lovely theater experience I've ever had. Good. Lovely. I loved Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, the movie. And I had already read most of the book. I think I got to the point where I was like, yeah, I have a feeling I know where this is going. So book was shit. But the, yeah. but the movie. Exactly. The movie was a ton of fun. Yeah. The book was shit. I read it. And I was like, okay, so essentially Seth Graham just cut and pasted Pride and Purchase. He went to yes. Gutenberg. And, and they added Pride the word zombie. Purchase. Yeah, mm -hmm. and added the word zombie. And I'm like, this is shit. And Clark yeah. Books published it. And so why am I not making millions? Yeah. So He's, that was my, I agree. That my, I agree that, that the thing. casting in the movie yeah. so dead on. I had Agreed. really wished to see that cast do a straight up version of Pride and Prejudice as well. 
because I really, really liked who they got and where they put them in Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. I, and I don't remember any other details about the book except or about the movie, except that I really enjoyed it. And I thought the cast was spectacular, but I remember no other yeah. details except for some ass kicking fights, which I thought were yeah. awesome. Lizzie, Lizzie and her sisters kicking ass and taking yeah. names is, is, is pretty fantastic. And- the big showdown between Lizzie and Lady Catherine de Bourgh. It's just, <gasps> I'm not a big fan of making the subtext text, but that was awesome. Yeah. That's a good place to do it. Yes. That's reposting all the Dracula episodes and listening to many of them. It's another thing like with Jane Austen, just a hundred years, almost a hundred years later, that there's so much modern modernity just in general in Dracula. And Bram Stoker was an outsider, Irishman, basically passing as a British man in London. And I think that helps make his stuff timeless. Jane Austen, I think all the women writers are outsiders from the main societal construct. And that gives them an interesting take, a a useful to read take on society as well. Here's a a question for both of you. I'm I'm a big romance reader. I write romance the world fucking sucks and I I don't want to read I just I don't want to read something unless there's some kind of happiness Mm -hmm. in the book that may change I read cross genres but I tend to uh, anyways so Austin is considered to be a the the grandmother godmother of romance Mm -hmm. she pretty much gave Georgette her her career but I have read in the past that Austin is not a romance novelist because of the themes and the context and her stories in general uh, produce so much more. What wow. hill are you standing on? Do you think I'm letting think- Rebecca's taking this? She is. I the have expert. a whole spiel on this. Yay! Okay. But I totally agree that Austin is the godmother of romance. Like we draw so many of our tropes from Pride and Prejudice specifically. Now, whether those tropes are used in a way that is actually in line with how Austin wrote it, whole other subject. But I think she writes really good romances in her books, but her books are not romance. One, because the genre was not there yet in the way that we think of the romance genre now, but also because it does have other things. So for me, the difference is that a romance genre book is a book that is primarily concerned with the romance. That is the heart of the whole thing. That is the end all be all. That's what the plot is about. There can be other things for sure. And I've read some great romance novels that deal with all sorts of wonderful topics, but the main thrust of it, sorry, is (laughs) the romance. Yeah, the main thrust of it is the romance and the romance has the main thrust. But With Jane Austen, the romance is part of it. The romance is part of the plot for sure, but it is not the main thing. It's not the be all end all. In a lot of ways, it's a plot device for exploring all these ideas about family and society and education and different philosophical views like sense and sensibility, which really I don't think can be considered a romance because the male heroes don't have a lot of page time. When you really think about it, particularly Edward Ferris, her, she's using these romantic plots to tell different stories and to further all these other ideas. The romance is in service to other things, whereas in a romance novel, everything else is often in service to the romance. What do you think? You can disagree. (laughs) I love it. I love a good book debate. Let's do it. Okay. So I agree with you that Austin brings a lot to the novel and that romance aspect of it is a plot device. I agree with that. However, we would typically call, I hate this phrase, but it's the way books are generalized. We would possibly call Austin's books women's fiction because women, her books deal with so much more than just romance but and this is a big but each of her novels have a happily ever after and that is the crux of romance 
is regardless of what you're writing about, as long as there's a romantic element and there's a conflict between the hero and heroine that gets resolved and it ends in a happily ever after, it's a romance. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, I want to read something to you because this puts a different question in the middle of this. And I think what you guys are saying, both of you, is really interesting. This is, again, from the from Irina, who wrote in about the feminist leanings of Jane Austen's novels. She wrote, finally, I am wondering if in Emma, Jane Austen shows us her ideal for a female life and a destiny. She does not make Emma perfect, but she allows her to be free and independent and intelligent and respected everything most women don't really have at that time and age. The focus of the book is mostly on Emma's growth as a person. From the moment she steps into a bigger world, as her brother-in-law states at some point, in fact, Emma's love story is not that important. And even if it were removed, I don't think it would spoil anything for the readers. Although I do like happy endings, so I'm really glad it's there. And I thought this is the one Jane Austen book that I would say doesn't, need a happy ending the same and the marriage happy ending like i wanted it in pride and prejudice and in persuasion i think persuasion is if any of her books can be classified as just a straight up romance novel i think it's persuasion yeah because that really everything hinges on them getting together for realsies yeah and and the thing is that persuasion is probably one of my favorite austin books but I awfully admit Anne Elliot does not have a spine, but her growth as a character and her steadfastness and her love for Wentworth is what does it for me. And she gets a spine when her <laughs> Anne Elliot. Yeah. I think she's got a spine. I think she just, it's a very gentle spine. It's not the obstinate headstrong girl that Lizzie no. marched oh, to no. make waves. But when something really matters to her and when she has a well-reasoned logic for it, she can be very steadfast. Little things like saying goodbye to the people in the parish, it was thrust upon her because nobody else wanted to do it, but that was something that she recognized as important. She did try to exert some influence over her father and sister to economize and draw back a little bit. She just wasn't loud or brash about it. And I think a lot of the feeling that she is spineless comes from her breaking the engagement the first time around, which I totally get because it's just, girl, run away. Your family sucks. This guy is great. It's going to be fine. And I totally believe, like with all my heart, that if they had married back then, they would have been fine. They would have had a good life. It would have been difficult in many ways, but they would have come through fine and they would have grown together. But, sorry, I don't, like I get the reasoning. And this is something that, you know, Austin writes about in the last few chapters. If you like, even Anne feels that she still made a well-reasoned choice in the, sorry, it's a little hot in here. A pretty good choice, which was to recognize that she was very young and she was very sheltered and to listen to the advice of the people she trusted. I honestly don't think that it was her dad's disapproval that did anything. It was Lady Russell's and Lady Russell from her mom. Basically, she was her mother figure for many years and she with her life experience, didn't have a good reason to doubt Lady Russell and what she was telling her was best for her. It it caused a lot of hurt for her and for Captain Wentworth. And I think there are regrets, but also I don't think it was a spineless or bad decision. It was her trying to do the right thing and trying to listen to someone who is important to her. And also just, it shows how important those ties are to her. Because even if they had gotten married and they'd been fine and they'd been happy together, it would have hurt her relationships with the people who did matter. 
And that was something that at that time was very difficult for her to give up. So I don't think she was spineless, but I think we can say she was misguided. Don't like having nuanced and reasonable arguments thrown at me. It makes me anxious. I know. Stop Um, hurting me with facts. (laughs) Not facts, opinions. Uh, Um, Nuance. It is nuanced. And I think it is very nuanced. And yeah, Lady Russell totally did Anna a a dirty. There's no doubt about it. Her father and sisters did not help. Maybe that's ultimately what I'm referring to about having a spine is that she found it incredibly difficult to stand up to her father, her sisters, and but Lady Russell was going to argue probably more important to her than her family, just because of the influence that Lady Russell has given her. We do see later on that Lady Russell is contrite about how she handled it. But I think, again, it, a lot of it had to do with the fact that here comes Captain Wentworth and he is oh, yeah. making the money and oh, yeah. he is 100%. That's Lady Russell, that's not Anne's opinion changing. It's just no, Anne. Uh, no, Anne still sees Lady Russell as the mother figure she does not have, regardless of what. And she loved Wentworth when he was poor. Yeah, the money doesn't make a difference to Anne, but it does make a difference to how well he can fit into her life and her existing relationships. I also yeah, think that's that fair. it would have been, especially looking at the fiscal relationship between women and their future, that until Anne Elliot is married, she is completely dependent on her family. And so there's a real, we talk about the the different agency that you've got with the knightly Emma relationship, just because he's so much older and she's so much younger, but there's that same kind. And, and to me, that's like the professor student master slave relationship. That's there's a power dynamic there that people are not talking about and really should. It seems to me that the power dynamic in persuasion is I can't leave my father's house. I can't risk getting kicked out of my father's house. So my father becomes a tyrant and I have to make myself miserable just because what are my other choices if I don't have a husband? And mm-hmm. that, that, that that kind of societal restriction that gets placed on women, especially at this time period, it's easier to see when you're talking about slavery, especially chattel slavery in the United States. It's the, it's so stark and so wrong. And to a greater or lesser degree, women have been in that situation for all women have been in that situation for a really long time. Oh yeah. We're still in it. Absolutely. Yeah. We're I mean, certainly heading think... back into it. Oh, yeah, in oh. Texas. And you're in yeah. Texas. Yay. I... You can come visit. I used to live in Kentucky. I feel you. But yeah, women, thanks, thankfully, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg fought for the right to women to get credit cards. You know, and, Amen, and, sister. In the 1970s. And in my lifetime. Same thing with getting mortgages, not until the mid-70s. It's just insane. And women of color didn't get the right to vote to the 60s. Sorry, I just, I get really fired up about this topic. No, we're no, right um, there with you. Yeah, oh, wow. it's part of Jane Austen's world too, because yeah, it absolutely is. These and, kinds of rights were important, and I think that's with with Emma. She's showcasing this is what it could look like when you have a woman with autonomy mm-hmm. and authority over her own personhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and she I may think, choose the guy at the end, but she doesn't need to choose exactly. Um, yeah. It's, it's an important distinction. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think, keep going. All this kind of goes back to something we've touched upon throughout the discussion of how much of a disservice we do, not just to Austin, but to our own reading when we flatten things mm. in Austin and when we divorce it from the context or we just focus on the age difference between Emma and Knightley instead of how that relationship actually plays out on the page, we deprive ourselves of these challenges to our thinking and to our understanding of the world. And it's very easy to look at Nyleen Emma and be like, ooh, he's 16 years older than her. Gross. She was a baby when he was a teenager and he's known her the whole time. If you read it, you're like, is this actually a very healthy relationship? And every step of the way, he is just acting as a friend to her and he never tries to influence her in service to his own desire, but just 
in trying to be a good friend and help her be the best person she can be, whether that's with him, with someone else, without anybody. And also like with Anne Elliot, it's really tempting to say she has no spine. This girl just can't stand up for herself, which I totally get. It's very tempting because we like things to be simple. We like black and white, but Jane Austen writes in a very shades of gray world. And I think when we're reading those things and we have to stop and be like, okay, is she spineless? Did she make a really bad decision? Did she make a decision that seemed right at the time, but turned out to cause a lot of needless hurt because they would have been okay? All these things. We're not just learning about the characters in their world, but we're learning about humanity and we're learning about the complexity of life and figuring out what is important to us. And I think that's why you can reread Austen over and over again is I read it for the romance sometimes and that's it. And sometimes I read it because I want to take a look at deeper things and see how Jane Austen dealt with it. But I think both of the books that we focused on the most couldn't have been written by young Jane. Lady Susan started as young Jane and even though she revised it later, stayed as young Jane. But Emma and Persuasion really... Yes. And Mansfield Park is a didactic novel. I don't put that in with anybody else or any of the other books. But these two seem to me to be books written by grown up person who had history to look back on, personal history to look back on. Speaking about gray areas and how things were at the time, here is a decisive commentary. The song Baby, It's Cold Outside. Oh, 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 my goodness. Bringing things up for me. (laughs) All right. Literally Trigger warning. Little hands together. Go for it. Yeah. Contemporary. Look at it. It is a gaslighting, grooming, all the isms you can think of that if this was going on in 2024 America, we would be like getting the fuck away from this guy. But song came out in a period where women's autonomy, what she's doing, he it's not that he's grooming her or gaslighting her. It's she's essentially rejecting the patriarchy and the idea of what she what women of her age are supposed to do no you are not allowed to be alone with a man and she's like saying yes i am i I am making this choice to be here i am trepidatious because if i leave or stay longer this is going to be what is thought of me or seen of me yeah Hmm. And when I saw that argument, I was like, hot damn, I agree with that. And this is a song that if you bring this up, even today, there's a lot of people with blinders on who do not take that nuance into effect. Gone with the Wind is another very nuanced book and movie that I have a very complicated relationship with. But Becca kind of talked about this when relating to Anne Elliot. It's a gray area. You cannot make a hot decision. You have to really think about what was being said at this time. Now, if your opinion after all this is still what it was when it began, that's exactly what it is. It's an opinion and I welcome you to it. I'm not, I, I, as I've gotten older, I have tried not to yuck people's yums. Just just because why I stand on hills about the 2022 version of Persuasion and the 2005 version of Pride and Prejudice, I enjoy it. Devony Loser supports the supports Persuasion. She is a Jane Austen expert. Who am I to argue with her? Especially the language used in the movie. She came right out and said that a lot of thought processes about words and phrases that were used, for example now we're exes it totally was used in that time period in that way the tiffany effect yeah yeah exactly so anyways i went from baby it's cold outside to um defending persuasion anyways yes so um, explain the tiffany effect becca okay so the tiffany effect is basically where tiffany is a very modern sounding name and so we think that it's fairly recent. And if we read the name Tiffany in like a historical fiction novel, you'll immediately be like, oh, no, that's inaccurate. 
when in fact it is a very old name that people did have back in the 1800s and 1700s. So it is something that is historically accurate that feels anachronistic and will take readers out. So that's the Tiffany effect. Back to Baby It's Cold Outside, though. Mm -hmm. Another example of things taken out of context. Mm -hmm. So the, I don't know if y'all know this, the song was written by a husband and wife songwriting team. And apparently they used to host parties at their home. And it was like the kind of Hollywood party that you think about where there's like people doing their bits and singing and dancing, all that stuff. And they would sing this song to signal to people like, okay, it's time to go home now. It's that context of it's driving people out, but it's also the context of this was written by a very loving married couple and it's got a little tongue in cheek and it is meant to be very affectionate. And so if you look at it completely divorced from that and you just look at the the lyrics from a very modern viewpoint and people will be like the say what's in this drink line they're like oh it's a roofie and it's no it's probably just hard liquor Uh, things like that also it was used in an esther williams film with ricardo montalban and they did two versions one with esther and ricardo and then one with red skelton and oh i'm blanking on her name but she's fabulous betty garrett and they show it in two different ways, which is also very interesting to watch because in yeah. one, you've got Ricardo acting like he's all sly and trying to seduce her and Esther just being like, bye. <laughs> and then in the other one, Betty Garrett is just strongly coming on to poor Red Skelton who cannot resist. So yeah, context, but also like critical thinking. <laughs> There's will, also a- so many ties to Mary Wollstonecraft, just to bring it back to that, mm-hmm. because that is no matter which way you read it, there are implications in vindications of the right, rights of women that are definitely showing up in any reading of that song. And mm-hmm. I personally love it. It cracks me up. I think it's hilarious. But I am also 28 years into a very loving relationship with a guy who still loves me. So yay. But but we were theater people. So for us, the the whole theater thing of that song is what tracks. But yeah, yeah I, I cut you off, Lisa. What were you saying? I was just going to say, I'm a big fan of etymology. It's like the only reason why mm. I, I got a subscription to Oxford English Dictionary yes. was so I could read up etymologies on words. So that mm-hmm. was like the best hundred bucks a year I could spend. Mm-hmm. But I looked up the name Tiffany. It actually dates back to the 12th century. Mm-hmm. It comes from Greece. It actually comes from, it's a English version of a Greek name, Theoph- Theophania, but the modern connotation of it is actually spawned from Breakfast at Tiffany's. So that's where it comes in modernity, but it actually, as Becca has said, it, it dates back to the 12th century. I'm going to have to post a, a CGP Grey video for you guys to watch because he did, I think he did two videos of going down the rabbit hole, researching all the different places that Tiffany shows up. It's like watching an Oxford English Dictionary etymology party. It's so much fun. And it's animated, which makes it even more lovely. fun because... Oh, lovely. Yeah. No, you will you will enjoy it. I will post it. It's... <laughs> but it is a problem. And there's a lot of things like, oh my God, when we did Gulliver's Travels, right around the same... Because of the zeitgeist... Right around the same time that Jack Black's Gulliver's Travels came out, all the all these critics were criticizing Jack Black person for the scene where he pees on the fire in the castle of the Lilliputians. And they're like, do we really have to be this tacky? Can we please just grow up? And it's like, dude, it's in the book. That, that is actually in the book. <laughs> And people don't read books, so. No, absolutely and not. That's what we're here books. for. Are they reading the books? <laughs> uh, no. No, the question is, are they reading the original oh, or yeah. translation of it, or are they reading an interpretation? But also, or, like, are it? you reading it? Are you just superficially taking it in? Or are you reading it and thinking about it and actually engaging with it? Because I think that's two different levels of reading, Yeah, even if it's the same text. 
Yeah, that's that's 100% true. In the past, when I've read Pride and Prejudice or Persuasion or any of Austin's work, it's always been superficial. And I'll readily admit that. But reading it chapter by chapter for TikTok is where the commentary came in. I engage with what is being said. And in some cases, I have to explain it to the audience because the way that mm-hmm. Austin uses language is not what we would work with in contemporary times. And that's after I got to the chapter where Mr. Bennett is chiding Mrs. Bennett about his, he's teasing her about going to see, going to Netherfield. And the way that Austin sets the scene, it's very clear from the wording that what he says to her, that he's teasing her in a good mannered way. And that he, he was, he's in love with her, was once in love with her and he loved her for her beauty or her looks or whatever the case is. And he was actually, I remember correctly because it had been a couple months, but she married up in into it. And then I read these criticisms that they were an arranged marriage. No, no Austin specifically says that he's a tradesman's you know, daughter. Sure, her family is in trade. He's a gentleman. That's marrying up. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a love match. And reading the criticism that's saying it isn't, I'm like, mm, you're not reading Austin. I'm sorry, you're reading somebody else. Yep. I've got a, I, now I've got to play one more link for you. And actually I'm totally blowing it because I was going to use this in when I read you Pride and Prejudice, but the, this is a setup from, I don't know how many years ago this was like 10 years ago. I can't remember in England, the setup is Jane Austen versus the, uh, Charlotte Bronte or no, all the Brontes because Emily and all come in. So the guy who's setting up Jane Austen, they have actors on stage to, to portray the texts. And I played a chunk of Emma that was done here, the the Emma with Mr. Elton finally confessing. And it is so brilliantly done that it changed my entire view of how that scene works. So he does the same thing here, but with Pride and Prejudice. And what he does is he brings out the first part of the first chapter minus the opening line. Because we get so used to the opening line, but as a universal, the whole thing, don't pay attention to that. Instead, if you pay attention to what they're saying to each other, you get a whole different read on Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. And I am totally excited to be able to show this to you guys. I'm just so excited. All right. My dear Mr. Bennett, said his lady to him one day, have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? Mr. Bennett replied that he had not. But it is, returned she. For Mrs. Long has just been here and she has told me all about it. Mr. Bennett made no answer. But do you not want to know who has taken it? Cried his wife impatiently. You want to tell me and I have no objection to hearing it. (laughs) This was invitation enough. Why, my dear, you must know, Mrs. Long says that Netherfield is to be taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England, and that he came down on Monday in a chaise and four to see the place, and was so much delighted with it that he agreed with Mr. Norris immediately that he is to take possession before Michaelmas, and some of his servants is to be in the house by the end of the week. What's his name? Bingley. Is he married or single? Oh, single, my dear, to be sure. A single man of large fortune, four or five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How how can it affect them? (laughs) My dear Mr. Bennett, how can you be so tiresome? You must know that I'm thinking of him as marrying one of them. Is that his design in settling here? Design? How can you talk so? But it is very likely that he may fall in love with one of them, and therefore you must visit him as soon as he comes. Oh, I see no occasion for that. You and the girls may go. Or you may send them by themselves, which perhaps will be still better, for as you are as handsome as any of them, Mr. Bingley may like you the best of the party. (laughs) My dear, you flatter me. I certainly have had my share of beauty. But I do not pretend to be anything extraordinary now. When a woman has five grown-up daughters, she ought to give over thinking of her own beauty. In such cases, a woman has not often much beauty to think of. But, my dear, you must indeed go and see Mr Bingley when he comes into the neighbourhood. It's more than I engage for, I assure you. But consider your daughters. Only think what an establishment it would be for one of them. 
Sir William and Lady Lucas are determined to go merely on that account, for in general you know they visit no newcomers. Indeed, you must go, for it would be impossible for us to visit him if you do not. Oh, you're over-scrupulous, surely. I dare say Mr Bingley will be very glad to see you, and I will send a few lines by you to assure him of my hearty consent to his marrying whichever he chooses <laughs> of the girls. <laughs> Though I must throw in a good word for my little Lizzie. I desire you will do no such thing. Lizzie is not a bit better than the others. I am sure she is not half so handsome as Jane, nor half so good-humoured as Lydia, but you're always giving her the preference. They've none of them much to recommend them. <laughs> <laughs> They're all silly and ignorant like other girls, but Lizzie has something more of quickness than her sister. Mr Bennet, how can you abuse your own children in such a way? You take delight in vexing me. You have no compassion for my poor nerves. Oh, you mistake me, my dear. I have a very high respect for your nerves. <laughs> They are my old friends. I have heard you mention them with consideration these last 20 years at least. Ah, oh, you do not know what I suffer. But I hope you will get over it and live to see many young men of 4,000 a year come into the neighbourhood. <laughs> it will be of no use to us if 20 such should come, since you will not visit them. Oh, depend upon it, my dear, that when there are 20, I will visit them all. <laughs> Doesn't... I think it, part of it is just having the audience there and getting to hear where they're laughing. But I'd never heard that text that way before, where exactly what you were saying before, Lisa, that they are really are in love. Mm -hmm. And and that changes so much about what comes next. And that well, I will say is one thing I really like about the 2005 version is it's, I think, the only adaptation I've seen that shows that affection between them. Yeah, and I'll admit, that's where I'm influenced by it. The other thing, too, as far as nuance goes, with Mrs. Bennett, that's, she knows. She's, she knows exactly what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. There, the, 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 um, the estate is entailed. Every son has died. They're screwed. Um, yeah, they're absolutely fucking screwed. And yep. uh, if one of the girls has to get married, at least one uh, yes. to be able to provide. Jane lived this. She and Cassandra shuffled yes. off, especially when Reverend Austin died. She and Cassandra and their mother shuffled off everywhere. Yeah, so no idea what. Yeah, and it's just, and I think Mrs. Bennett gets a bad rap and, and it goes back to nuance and the time period. And she's, I, I feel for her. And yeah. Brenda Blythin's, portrayal of her it's just i love it love it love it love it but i love that what you just given us i think that was fantastic and the other thing too as far as nuance goes we hear ten thousand pounds and i think modern minds are like that's it that's nothing yeah i that's one of the things i talk about when i read year. yeah when i read Anchor. pride and prejudice on tiktok i give commentary like okay so ten thousand pounds a year is actually over a hundred thousand american dollars a year now and you can, and this is not talking about his holdings. This is his income. Yeah. And you can this live very not comfortably. The principle. Yep. You can live very comfortably on $100,000 a year, which seems awful to say because we shouldn't need to make that much people live comfortably. But, and the same for Bingley, he's coming in around 50, 60,000. And I think it's important to understand that context when you're talking about what Austin is saying at that time. Uh, a nuance is our word for this, this podcast because we keep using it a lot. But it's true. It's absolutely 100% true. They And they are the one, even 100,000 sounds small right now, but they are the 1%. There were no billionaires mm -hmm. that you had to go up against, except by, and even the royals didn't have that much money. These guys are the 1%. And I got it wrong with Emma early on, and I got corrected by several different people, that Emma's fortune is 20,000 pounds. But that's her entire fortune. That's her investments, which mm -hmm. for women had to be counted out and identifiable. Whereas with guys, because the principal is usually land and investments, it's a squishier number, which is why it can change. And knowing the range that they're in is what matters because that principle could change. So but you are paying attention to how much they're gonna make every year off, basically off the interest. What were you gonna say, Becca? Just going back to the Bennetts and Nuance, it's been so interesting to watch this conversation evolve over the years 
because for a very long time, all I was hearing is just like mockery of Mm -hmm. Mrs. Bennett Mm -hmm. and oh, she's the worst and she's so silly. All she cares about is marriage. And in the past few years, there's been this conversational shift to no, she has very valid concerns about her children and her own welfare after he dies. And these are very practical reasons. And I'm really interested to see when we get to the really nuanced point, which is in between, which is yes, she has very practical concerns and she's right to be anxious about this. That is not what Austin is criticizing. Austin is criticizing the kind of gauche manner in which she expresses that concern and goes about trying to find some safety for herself and her children. It's fine that she wants them to marry comfortably and well. Expected. Yeah, it's that's good. It's not okay that she is so tacky about it. Yeah. And so forward and so loud in talking about it with everybody where anybody including Mr. Darcy can here, it's the manner in which she expresses her concerns and tries to fix it that is the problem, both because it's tacky and also because that does, in the society, materially hurt her daughter's chances as well. Because the whole thing about marriage and trying to find one at that time is it's important for women to get married, and everybody knows that. But you're not supposed to want to get married just for money. You're supposed to want the love marriage. And you're supposed to conduct yourself in a way where you're not telling people you're marrying for security and money. So it's fine to want those things, but there's this fine line between wanting that and letting people see that you're just after money. And isn't it Miss Bingley in... Pride and Prejudice, who says at one of the the parties out loud where Elizabeth can hear, but <clears throat> says it to Darcy, how much fun you would have with her as your <laughs> mother-in-law, yeah. I think. And that's like the one window that you get into, okay, I'm not imagining how loud and pushy she is. That is her presentation outside of the home. Yeah. But I agree that I, when I was teaching high school in New York City, often with these books, or with even with Scarlet Letter, I had kids who claimed she's just a gold digger. Hester got caught, but really she was just a gold digger. She was just trying to get a guy by sleeping with him, and that's all there was to it. And by the end, they recognized what was really going on. But that's a, that's a, a hard explanation to make when, as Mary Wollstonecraft says, the training that women go through to be the nice girls and follow all the rules and all of those things is subtext for the guys. They don't, they're in power. They don't need to see what's happening, but the women sure know. And uh, all of my professors of Jane Austen prior to doing Craftlet had been men. Mm. So I had a lot to learn, which by the way, the one guy who I would say really gets it because he, and he makes lovely comments about Charlotte in Pride and Prejudice, but it's John, whoops. This is John Mullen, who was the guy who set up the and made the argument pro Jane in that that Jane Austen versus Emily Bronte series. So, Uh, just just so you know, Heather, I do have the Vindication of the Rights of Women on Kindle that I probably downloaded a hundred million years ago. And all our conversations today, I will probably read us. Just to, I've, I've posted the first part of the introduction, and tomorrow we should get the second part of the introduction. And I'm also curious, do you read nonfiction as part of a craftlet? I'm very new to your podcast. I I have to read a lot of nonfiction. I've got three more. A lot of nonfiction about the books that we're going to do to be able to make sure I'm not missing anything. Because mm-hmm. I have a lot of listeners who have read these books many times and have done research themselves. And so if mm-hmm. I miss something, they will... They will write in and tell me, which is great. But the, this year, Emma has been particularly hard because I got long COVID and reading at all right now, but especially reading nonfiction and tracking it has been a real challenge. So these these books, some of them are not read all the way. The reason why I asked is if you want to read nonfiction for fun, mm-hmm. I'm reading Shakespeare's Sister. Oh, yeah. My husband by- read that. 
by Rami Targoff. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, I love it. So far what I've read of it, I haven't read that much, but what I've read, I think it's a fantastic vehicle for discussions because there's all these women writers who are writing in the Renaissance era that even our contemporaries like Austin, I don't want to say forget, but these women are so overlooked that it's difficult to see their influence, even though it does exist. Yeah. And that we've been on here for a little bit. I am going to say, Becca, did you have any final things to say? Because I think I've gotten all the links and everything. I, I love Emma. I promised everybody that at the end of this live stream, I was going to announce the next book. So I will tell you what's happened. I got a fabulous actor who can do all the voices to agree to read Moby Dick out loud for us because it's the <laughs> one book that people keep asking for along along with Middlemarch, which that's a different problem and it is being recorded, but it's just going to take years. Would you call it your white whale? I, <laughs> I would call it my white whale indeed. I see, I see what you did there. Yes. And so I, I got him to agree to read all the fun chapters, the story plot chapters, and I would read all of the boring whaling chapters, the ambergris chapters and everything. So it's like Princess Bride, just the fun parts version. This week has not done good things to lots and lots of people. So we are on hold with Moby Dick. At some point it will happen, but I have two different books that I just found this out before we got on the live stream. I have two different books that I'm putting on deck and I may wind up doing all of them at some point, finishing Vindication of the Rights of Women, redoing the Pride and Prejudice, Cranford, the one book that's, it's Elizabeth Gastel, Gaskell, it's episodic-ish, it's light, it's not north and south, and it's just people getting along. It seems like maybe the right thing to do right now. But the other thing that I'm going to be doing interspersed with all of that is some Kafka because nobody reads Kafka anymore. And I think being able to have, to see how somebody wrote when language stopped meaning what language means is important. I think it's interesting. You didn't choose a, you didn't choose Charlotte Bronte because Gaskell wrote her biography. Oh, we already did Jane Eyre and I haven't done, we did Tenant of Whitefell Hall. We did Jane Eyre. We did Wuthering Heights as a premium book because people would have stopped listening to the podcast if that had been the main book and told me that. But there's a Bronte sister biography, actually the all four Brontes, that if you haven't read it before, it's called Wild Genius on the Moor. I think it's Judith Butler. And when you talk about nonfiction, that is a page turner. It's incredible. And she digs into research that Elizabeth Gaskell didn't have access to or did, but just ignored. And I love me some Elizabeth Gaskell. We did North and South and I love that book. But you, oh, you will love Genius on the Moors. It's spectacular. That's where I'm at. I think I'm not, if I start a new book in January, it'll probably be Cranford. And that's light and sweet and easy. And then Juliet uh, Barker, Juliet Barker. Thank you. She's, and I she think... worked at Bronte, the Bronte center. She worked there at the Parsonage in England for a while. The Jane Austen and company who actually is the spin off of Jane Austen summer program did a year long Austen and Bronte comparison, mm. having different speakers come in and talking about topics that I've had uh, approached both of them. So I haven't, I'm, I'm a terrible fan. I haven't checked those out, but it's been on my to-do Thanks. list. Now you have a vote for that one. It is an easy read. I was shocked because it is not a thin book as well. They were prolific in ways that most human people aren't. And it doesn't surprise me that they didn't like Jane Austen because the rags that they were growing up reading were all the Byronic. Well, bodice and ripper stories in the magazines that they were getting access to for them this would have been boring like Bronte's versus austin is very much eleanor versus marianne yes it's like the passion and the uncontrollable feelings versus reason and constraint yeah. and logic and ooh, 
maybe this might not turn out well with this toxic man, which is why I'm always so interested to learn like who likes Austin, who likes the Brontes, who likes both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there, there's so many ideological conflicts between the two. That was one of the reasons why when Kate, the librarian said, my friend, Lisa does uh, all Austin, all Bronte Substack. Maybe she'd come on. I said, yes, because if you love both of those people as writers, then nuance is your middle name. You not see extra oh, in those two I think some people would people. disagree and say I'm a bull and a child. I think there are people who don't see. Can I say my kind of inflammatory thing? Do it. Okay. The 2005 Pride and Prejudice. Oh, God. I like it as a movie. I don't love this adaptation. But the thing that I always say is 2005 Pride and Prejudice is Jane Austen for Bronte lovers. Oh, I like that. Ooh. I absolutely do like that. That's it mad makes, deep. Right? Yeah. It's, it's. Okay, so what's the reasoning ungodly. behind it? What's yeah. the reasoning behind it? Just, it's so much more about passion than about. Mm reason it's got the mood that you associate with Bronte more than you associate with Austin like you literally have people strolling on the moors and you have this very dashing Darcy coming through in his shirt unbuttoned and, and I'm not gonna unbuttoned. say I don't like yes. it I, I actually am one of the people who really loves Matthew McFadden as mm -hmm. Darcy and that's my favorite part of the movie but it's much more sensibility than sense that is yeah. a really interesting take. I that's, totally that's... get that. And that's a and good I'm way not to gonna... describe how okay, people okay. respond to a lot of movies, yeah. especially moody movie adaptations. By the way, but... Lisa, if you haven't seen the podcast uh, Lost Lost in Lost in Adaptation, the YouTube channel, but also there's a different person, a couple that does that Lost in Adaptation on. Oh no, they do Adapter Parish, and which is awesome. And so they read all the versions and then watch, and then that's their podcast. So it's like once a month. Yeah, I was going to mention, I'm so tired of slamming of the 2005 version that I decided because I have copious amount of free time, um, I was going to watch 2005 and talk about it on TikTok. And I was going to compare it. I was going to try and compare it chapter by chapter. And I think, because I wanted, I, I haven't, I have I, I read Austin for enjoyment. I don't read it for the academic aspect of it, but I wanted, but my remembrance of the book against the movie seemed pretty pretty tightly wound. I didn't really see a lot of. I'm not going to argue and say or disagree and say yeah it's not perfect, but neither is 1995. No, I don't um, think 1995 is perfect either. <laughs> but the so I'm reading it and. The first four chapters are condensed in four minutes, I think, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. And wow. it is almost a, the first, if I remember correctly, the first four chapters are condensed in the first four minutes of the movie. And it's almost a, a, a chapter by chapter adaptation is on par because you're taking out a lot of dialogue. Yes, but the current, the, the, the flow of events happens in that time so i'm curious to see how the rest of it's going to turn out when i get back to watching it but yeah yeah that, that i guess for final thoughts if you want to hear commentary and swears on pride and prejudice go to my tiktok excellent love it always a good thing and i'll be i will be pinging you again when i'm done with vindication for the craft absolutely it. this was a lot of fun i didn't realize it was going to be two and a half hours long it was mm -hmm. a lot of fun neither did i <laughs> I love it. This yep. has been so much fun. And this I love great. all of the ideas we touched upon. And I also love that you and I have so many of the same soapboxes, Lisa. Even and if friend me on Facebook, you can watch me rant about this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a lot. I know a few, I have quite a few friends who are Janites who will, will interact with me when I go on my Austin or Bronte tribes on my personal Facebook page and a lot of people are just like yeah that's Lisa just keep scrolling along there's I, she's, I she's, she's going out I about Austin there what else is there yeah well thank you both I really appreciate you coming on this is the first time that we've done anything like a YouTube post book 
retrospective, a look back and, and I especially appreciate that it didn't just stick with Emma. There's, yeah. I don't think you can talk about one book of Jane Austen's without talking about the rest in, if you're going to be fair and I love it. I was telling Kate, the librarian who I've known for 15 years now, she told me she had reached out to you. I was like, yeah, that's great. But I haven't read Emma in a long time. So I didn't think I was going to be able to contribute to the conversation. Are you kidding? And then I read Becca's blog post. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to sit there and be quiet and not occasionally. But yeah, I'm glad that it turned out to be a much more broader, in a lot of ways, nuanced oh. conversation about Austin and the Brontes and Mary Wollenscraft and everybody else that came along on our journey today. Yeah. Me too. This was a lot of fun. The new YouTube Craftlet Dash channel playlist for Vindication and the Rights of Women is actually under an old playlist name called the Weekly Constitutional, which I started in 2016, where I was talking to different lawyers every week about a new part of the Constitution, which people got sick and it ended. But that's where Vindication and the Rights of Women and Margaret Chase Smith's speech from uh, the 50s, when she was the only person in the Senate to speak out against Joe McCarthy. It was the female senator from Maine. And her speech has been misrepresented as being something that it is not. And when that happened, I woke up and had to record her real thing, just like I had to wake up and record Vindication on the Rights of Women. Does the audio go out? This one, I'm going to do an edit. Uh, like a quick edit and try and give it chapter mark chapter markers mm -hmm. so tomorrow night okay yeah because i've had people ask me who are like i hate you saying i am a member of good standing in two jasna chapters and one of them that i reached out to has said yeah this is great well we'll post it on our facebook page and she goes so do you know when it's posting no but i'll get yeah. it to you when i get it to you yeah no, I, I will absolutely get you the link when I've got the real version up on awesome. the Catholic site. Yeah. And we have had people watching. And in fact, Candy wrote in the chat, thank you for this discussion. So she found us here. Thank and, you. And, and thank you for tuning in, Candy. I'm very glad you were here. All right. You guys have a great week. I hate this part. It feels so tacky, but... If you like what you hear, please like, subscribe, support. You know the drill. All the links and information you might possibly need are in the show notes below. And thank you. Hi, it's Heather from Craftlit. It wouldn't be the first week of November 2024 if everything didn't go wrong. Today, our live stream streamed to my personal YouTube channel instead of the Craftlet one. And as a consequence, I've had to move it here. So I've added this intro and I've added thank yous at the end. And, uh, and I just wanted to let you know, book it with Becca. You can follow her on Goodreads. You can follow her blog. Links are in the notes below. Lisa Raby, who came and joined us. As our special guest, you can get all of her information at linktr.ee slash excessively diverting. She is many places as at excessively diverting. And I hope you go and listen and read more of what she shares. She's definitely a craft lit person and knitter. So, you know. And I believe she said right now she is reading Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice on her TikTok channel. So definitely go to her link tree and take a look and go and uh, have fun. Unlike most craftlet things, this one is not family friendly. There are, um, as listener Anne told me, as the sign that listener Ann made for me several years back, which says, I can swear like a well-educated sailor, that happens today. Again, well-educated, but also sailors. So, forewarned is forearmed, not for delicate ears.
All right, I think that's it. Let's dive into the live stream that went the wrong place, but is back now. Here you go. Hi, it's Heather from Craftlet. It wouldn't be the first week of November 2024 if everything didn't go wrong. Today, our live stream streamed to my personal YouTube channel instead of the Craftlet one. And as a consequence, I've had to move it here. So I've added this intro and I've added thank yous at the end. And, uh, and I just wanted to let you know, book it with Becca. You can follow her on Goodreads. You can follow her blog. Links are in the notes below. Lisa Raby, who came and joined us as our special guest. You can get all of her information at linktr.ee slash excessively diverting. She is many places as at excessively diverting. And I hope you go and listen and read more of what she shares. She's definitely a craftlet person and knitter. So, you know, And I believe she said right now she is reading Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice on her TikTok channel. So definitely go to her link tree and take a look and go and uh, have fun. Unlike most craftlet things, this one is not family friendly. There are, um, as listener Ann told me, as the sign that listener Ann made for me several years back, which says, I can swear like a well-educated sailor, that happens today. Again, well-educated, but also sailors. So, forewarned is forearmed, not for delicate ears. All right, I think that's it. Let's dive into the live stream that went the wrong place, but is back now. Here you go.